You know what speaker this is? Which microphone it is? Yeah. Hey, best. Uh... Hmm. There's a giant fly flyer here. Microphone. Who knows? Test. 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 That's not it. I couldn't get to work either, so I bet. Sound. Sound. Your sound input device. HD audio driver for display audio. Is that it? It's not the speaker, right? No, I wouldn't think so. Oh, that's the output. That's input. The input. Here we go. Microphone array. A new input device. Maybe expand this. Where that probably will collapse it. Two channels. Oh, that's not it. Test your microphone. Sometimes. Hello, hello, hello. 3%. So now that's not it. Beginning. Let's just add a device. Um, test, test, test. Oh, hold on. There's the other one. Cisco. Test. Speaker, where's the input? Select a microphone. Test. Test. Hmm. No Is there a mute someplace on Zoom? What's that? Is there a mute? Some Is it yeah, muted someplace? You can mute it, but... So this is just pulling from the computer audio right now, which I guess would be fine. And then I guess we can have Matt show us the this later. And then when I hit add device, um, it's wireless, I right? It's not Bluetooth. Hey, perfect timing. Perfect timing. Right, because I recorded well, I recorded the video, but I couldn't get any audio online. Yeah, so the audio is being we just don't know how to make this microphone work. Oh, the, yeah, I had problems with it. You did? No, I, I don't think it works last time. I would just not use it in use the built in laptop one. Yeah, I think did the other one record last week? I didn't look at the it's far away. I imagine it's not on its best side. Um, how to use? Hold down. We have a worship service today. I don't know. We can just use the computer audio.
luckily, Deuteronomy is not the longest thing to go through. I was in a sense. Let's just take this make sure we're actually putting it in. Okay. Oh, that's probably. Hey, okay. So it wasn't plugged in all the way. You really got to push it. Test, test. All right, good deal. Okay. Share screen. Is it sharing? Screen two. Yeah. Share that one. Dang, then all my stuff went up there. Oh, well, no worries. Okay. So this week we are doing Deuteronomy. And we'll start off with the Bible Project. Oh, well, maybe. Okay. Was working. Yeah, select a speaker. Let's Maybe you'd think we'd be more technolo technologically, uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, would it be this? Like a video output? No. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Sure. And we'll start from the beginning. The book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, and the final book of After the Exodus from Egypt, Israel was at Mount Sinai for one year, entering into a covenant with their God. And then they had the disastrous road trip through the wilderness, and the Exodus generation disqualified themselves from entering into the land promised. And so Deuteronomy begins with Moses standing in front of this new generation, explaining the whole. And it's from here that the design and purpose of the book are. Deuteronomy is a series of speeches from Moses where he's calling the next generation of Israel to be faithful to the covenant with their God. At the center of the book is a collection of laws, which are the terms of the covenant between God and Israel. Some of the laws are new, but many are repeated from the laws given earlier at Mount Sinai. And that's actually where this book gets its name, from a Greek word, deuteronomion, which means a second law. Surrounding these laws are two outer sections of Moses' speech. Each of these are broken up into two parts themselves. Let's just dive in and we'll see how this whole thing works. So Moses, first of all, summarizes the story so far, and he highlights how rebellious the previous generation was, in contrast with God's constant grace and provision in the world. God did bring his justice on them, yes, but he did not abandon his covenant promise. After this comes a series of very passionate sermons where Moses calls on this new generation to be more faithful than their parents were to the covenant. He reminds them of the Ten Commandments, and then the centerpiece of the section is the famous line called the Shema. Moses says, listen, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. This became a very important daily prayer in Judaism, and it brings all of the themes of the book together. So the word listen, or shema in Hebrew, it means much more than just hearing. Its meaning includes responding to what you hear, or in English we would say, okay. And the word love in Hebrew also means much more than just an emotion. It's about a decision, a wholehearted devotion to God that involves your will and your emotions, your mind and your heart. Now, for Israel, their obedience and devotion to God 
served a much larger purpose. Obedience to the laws is going to make Israel a unique people among the nations. Just like God said at Mount Sinai, they will become a kingdom of priests. And Moses now says, how? Israel has the chance by following the laws to show the whole world the wisdom and justice of God. The other key idea in the Shema is that Israel was called to obey and be devoted to the Lord's love. Or literally, in Hebrew, it says, the Lord is one. Now, in context, the point is that the Lord is the one God Israel is worship in those terms. Israel is about to go into the land of the king, where people worship idol gods that represent all different aspects of the creation. Sun, the weather, sex, and war. And in Moses' view, worshiping these gods degrades humans and destroys human beings. But worshiping the God of Israel, who's the creator and the redeemer, that will lead to life and blessing. And so we come to the large collection of laws at the center of the book. And they're roughly arranged by topic. So the opening section is about Israel's worship of their God. They were to have one central temple where one God would be worshipped. And also, God was to be worshipped in Israel's care for it. So, for example, all Israelites were to set aside one tenth of their annual income in the giving of the temple. But another tenth was to be set aside every three years and given to the poor. And these are the kinds of laws that put Israel on the cutting edge of justice in comparison to their ancient neighbors. And it was all bound up with their worship. The next section outlines the character qualities of Israel's leaders. So the elders, the priests, the kings, these were all placed under the authority of the covenant law, which God said that he would enforce by sending prophets to keep the leaders accountable. So in contrast to Israel's neighbors, where kings were thought of as divine and a law unto themselves, Israel's leaders were subordinate to law and law. Following this is a large section of laws about Israel's civil life, so rules about marriage and family and business, and also about social justice, their legal system and how it was to protect widows and orphans and infants. And then these are concluded by more laws about worship. Now, here's some tips for reading all of these laws. Remember, first of all, these are the terms of the Sinai covenant given specifically to ancient Israel, living in a culture that's very different. And so, too, it's not going to be helpful to compare these laws with modern laws in the very different culture. Rather, these were given to set Israel apart. And so, we need to compare these laws with those of Israel's neighbors in Assyria or Babylon. And when you do that, all of a sudden, laws that seem harsh or bizarre become much more clear. You see that God is pushing Israel to a higher level of justice than we've ever known. And so, finally, try to discern what core principles of wisdom or justice underlie any particular law. And you'll discover some really profound things. So here's an extra credit finally. Go and see how Paul the Apostle does this very thing in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 9. And he quotes a law from Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse 4. Mm-hmm. So back to Moses. After he goes through all of the laws, he issues a final challenge that Israel should listen to and love their God. He first issues a warning and an ultimate. If Israel listens to and obeys their God, everything is going to go great, lots of divine blessings. But if they don't listen and rebel, famine, plague, devastation, and ultimately exile from the land. And then Moses forces a decision. He says, today I set before you all life or death, blessing or curse, goodness or evil. So choose life by loving the Lord your God and listening. But then Moses says this. He says, I know that after I die, you're going to rebel and turn away from God and die in exile. Which is kind of a downer. But then again, he's been with these people for decades, and it becomes clear that his hopes are not very high. But all is not lost. One day, when Israel is sitting in exile, at any point, Moses says, they can turn back to their God. He will, in his way, circumcise your heart so that you may love him with all your heart and soul. Now, this is a vivid metaphor that's saying something is fundamentally wrong with Israel's heart. It's stubborn and hard. And it's the same thing wrong with the heart for all of humanity. This is going all the way back to the rebellion in the garden. Humans seized autonomy from God. They wanted to define good and evil for themselves, and they ruined God's good world as a result. But one day, Moses said, God is going to do something to transform the hearts of his people so that they can truly listen to and love God from the heart and be led back. And this is the promise that gets picked up by the later biblical prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the hope for a new heart. So Moses ends his speech with a poem, a warning, and then a blessing, and then he walks up onto a mountain and he dies. 
And so the Torah draws to a close. All of the major plot tensions of the biblical story are in place, but left totally unresolved. So when is the descendant of the woman going to come and defeat people? Or how is God going to rescue the whole world and bless all nations through this family? And how can God's holiness be reconciled with people who are continually rebellious? And how is God going to transform the heart? You just have to keep reading to find out. For now, that's the book of Deuteronomy. It's all about. Oh, no, wait. Okay. And then we got one more. This one's short. The name Deuteronomy is derived from the Greek translation, the ancient Greek translation. I mean, Deuteronomy, which is uh, the fifth book of the Bible, fifth book of the Old Testament, um, is considered the last of Moses, or the last of the first five books, which are called either the Pentateuch, definitely five books, or uh, the Torah. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy literally means second law. And it's actually a, a slight mistranslation of the phrase that's used in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, and where it talks about a a copy of the law. It has a very distinctive role in play uh, at the end of that first, uh, that first part of the, the Old Testament. And a very distinctive form in that it's presented as a farewell speech or a set of farewell speeches by Moses. He died at the end of the book in the final chapter, chapter 34. Uh, and immediately afterwards, the story continues then in the book of Joshua. The Israelites under Joshua's leadership cross the river Jordan and they enter and begin to take uh, possession of and to settle in the land of uh, the land of Canaan, Palestine. It's a rather mysterious story here in Deuteronomy 34. We're told that uh, Moses, uh, when he delivered this farewell speech, he goes up uh, a mountain, he looks across the Jordan, uh, he sees the promised land that the people are about to go in and enter. But he himself is not going to enter the promised land. That's been made clear already. And he, Moses just sort of, he, he gives a, a long term, it sort of fades from existence. We don't have any uh, mausoleum, no, no stone, no, nothing that's really set up in memory. But it does make Moses, of course, uh, not only a great heroic figure, but in some ways a kind of tragic hero in that uh, having led the people under God's direction to this point, he doesn't actually enter finally the, the promised land. And it simply says Moses was buried, uh, but not that any human buried him. God buried him. It's perhaps worth saying something here about um, the uh, the question as to whether Moses did write the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, it's presented it ostensibly as a a set of farewell speeches by Moses, as I said, but um, most uh, modern scholars, at least since the um, really since the early 19th century, have come to believe that uh, uh, Deuteronomy as we have it is a much later book. So you may have seen certain um, certain more con conservative Jews during uh, perhaps a morning prayers or a time of prayer, they're wearing a leather boxes on their, their, their wrists or on their shoulders and on their heads. And this idea to, to wear these boxes it comes from Deuteronomy. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, is this uh, famous prayer called the Shema. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. And it goes on and on. And then it says, bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. So they, uh, so they, they wear this just... It, it was in trying to be consistent with what they believe the, the tradition of scripture to tell them to do. They'll actually, they will actually wear these leather boxes on their arms and on their shoulder, on their forehead. And if you've ever wondered what that was, it, it comes from this idea of Shema, where they would take scriptures and they would put them in the parchment inside of these boxes, wear them on their heads and arms. Uh, we often talk about the first five books of the Old Testament as a whole as the law. The Jewish term Torah means something much more uh, positive, much more broad and all embracing and comprehensive than our term law, and that it includes what we would call teaching, instruction, guidance for the people of many different kinds. The book of Deuteronomy, in fact, includes uh, a recap 
of the story up to this point as well. Again, reminding people of how God has led them uh, by his goodness, by his special favor for them up to this point. Okay. One oh, wait. from your pantry. No. <laughs> All right. So, as the Bible Project states, and as the uh, the video, the small video there states, Deuteronomy is kind of like a a big summary by Moses to a new generation saying, hey, you're about to enter the promised land. I'm not going to be with you, but this is everything that happened, and here's some information you should know. Uh, it is the very last book of the Torah. Um, and this is just Moses addressing the people before his death. Now, we should talk about the, um, the small controversy of, did Moses write the book? And... Um, there's some there's some good evidence to say that maybe he didn't write the book, but for the most part, the authors of this textbook and my own thoughts are probably that Moses wrote the book with a couple addendums at the end, uh, after he died, before the book was fully formed. Um, and that's probably the best way to understand it. And if you want to dig in deeper about did Moses write Deuteronomy, um, that would be something fun to do on your own time um so we will do kind of a run through this and going to answer uh answers in our books because the answers in our books are actually really great so if you skip down to um Question, let's see, four of the background study. It's on page 52. So the background of this is we, it resembles a lot of ancient treaty, ancient, let me try this again, Near Eastern treaties. Um, and it looks an awful lot the same as uh, those look like. And the structure of those were they started with a preamble. Um, they went to a historical prologue. Sorry, I'll talk slower. Which is where we see Moses going through and giving a recount of the law and what's been happening uh, the past 38 years. Stipulations dealing with what is expected, which is the major uh, struct. Uh, the meat of this book. A statement regarding the document's display. Storage. Or terms. For its periodic recital. Uh, a list of witnesses. and curses or blessings to be affected by the gods according to the performance of these stipulations. Okay, and so we, the um, the structure of this looks a lot like this. And really, it was it was pretty recent that someone found a um, a explanation to how the middle of Deuteronomy is structured. Because if you just read Deuteronomy, it doesn't Deuteronomy. I always add a T. That's from my younger years. Um, if you just read it, it doesn't really have a whole lot of cohesion. It's kind of all over the place. It doesn't, it seems to not transition very well. Um, it's not the typical Moses writing that you would expect. But recently, 
someone has discovered that it's really structured as a review of the Ten Commandments in in the order of the Ten Commandments, which is great. Um, so let's see. This is formalization of the covenant between Israel and Yahweh. We know the covenant with the second Exodus. Okay, so we will start with these and kind of go through. And it's good to know, I don't remember if it's a question, but if you're taking side notes, um, commandments one to through four address uh, issues as they pertain to God. So our relationship with God. And then commandments five through 10 address issues as they pertain to human beings. So one through four is God, five through 10 is human beings. So commandment number one is divine authority. You should have no other gods before me. Um, and these chapters are six through 11, which are different from the rest of the uh, Ten Commandment chapters in that they don't have any specific laws. They just have explanations and um, reasons why you should follow this law. You should have no other God before me. So that is Deuteronomy 6 through 11. And the good thing about this is some of these commandments are very confusing, in my opinion. Um, some of the Ten Commandments that God gives are, it's a little bit weird to see how they would fit in our society and our structure. And this kind of gives a good explanation for those commandments, for why they would fit. And uh, he kind of goes in depth of what they mean, similar to how Leviticus is done, but just slightly different. Um, commandment two is you shall not make for yourself any idols. And that's Deuteronomy 12. And like the Bible project said, so they were about to move into the land of Canaan, which is a land full of idols. And I don't know if you have been here yet, but if you have something to say, just interject because I love hearing what other people have to say. Great. Um, but they're moving into the land of Canaan and the land of Canaan is full of idol worshipers. And um, the, the point of you shall not make for yourself an idol is God saying, I cannot be condensed into something that is visual. So that's why the temple was created. That's why these um, rules around the temple were created was for God to say, Hey, I want to dwell somewhere in the earth. And that's not going to be on an image that you've created. So he's giving them warnings saying, hey, before you go in there, make sure that you have this in your heart that you won't fall into making idols like they do. And uh, the, the stress is uniformity of what they're doing. You go to one place, you worship at one place, you find me at one place. Mm -hmm. Catholic Ten Commandments. Sorry, skirt that one. Wait, what? The list, the Catholic list of the Ten Commandments still include images. What did they put in there instead? You know, they were they, 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 because they you look at the icons. Oh, you know, all the icons. Yeah. In Eastern Orthodox and in in the Catholic Church. That's interesting. I never we, knew that. Yeah, I ran across that in uh, you know, like our church, we have a cross, but that's the closest we get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any iconography? Wow. I didn't know that. I've never heard that before. <laughs> um, and also with Canaanites worshiping idols, a lot of it was self indulgent really whereas this is worship to a deity to say uh, to to acknowledge sovereignty and authority all right commandment three 
is you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Um, it's, it's, I, I'd like to interject something. Yeah, please. Um, I went ahead and did uh, the verse. And does it sound, uh, according to this verse in the Second Amendment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Um, and then, then I go to the very next image and it mentions uh, uh, you, shall not, you shall not take a uh, another uh, sorry. thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image in other words okay an idol mm -hmm. so it's it's strange that uh that 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 you know uh, I, I know i've read the ten commandments over and over and over again and being a a, a, a kid minister teacher for i don't know how many years um it, it dawned, it just literally dawned on me that I, I believe I've actually caught it both ways. Mm. I can recall saying, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. And I, I can recall saying that, uh, you know, just like I said, Thou shalt not take unto thee any, you know, you know, you know uh, worship uh, any, any image or idol. Mm -hmm. I believe I've caught it both ways. So, which which is the truth of it, I guess? Uh, which is the uh, the true second thing? I mean, uh, second commandment. I would want to err on the side of safety and not order files. That's Yeah. Well, the third so, commandment. The third, commandment. Oh, well, here, the third commandment mentions not to the Lord's name that. Um, and, but this one is remember and keep holy the Lord's day. That's the Sabbath, though. Right. In that, like the, in that, um, the commandment is that waves smash wick one God images vain Sabbath. That's the fourth okay. commandment. All right, well, I, I, again, according, according, I, I, I got this off Etsy, but they would have mm -hmm. got somebody. And, and they specifically mentioned um, two being not taking the Lord's name in vain and three remembering the Sabbath for the Lord's Day and then goes into honoring the father and the mother of four. Hmm. The Catholic Archdiocese in Melbourne that they say, I'm the Lord your God, you shall not have any strange God before me. Uh, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, the Lord, your God, name in vain. I uh, remember to keep the Lord's day. Uh, our father and mother, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You not steal. You shall not bear a false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's good. Yeah, that's what I have here. Yeah, so yeah. That's, no idol. No, no idol. So they just take it out completely. Yeah, they kind of what? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. that's interesting. But, um, huh. yeah, that's weird. So then, is their commandments a different order than ours? So that was that was the order. That was the order. Wow. So they just take it out and move everything back one. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, it's actually think thirteen. If you can break them down, okay. I think there's in in I think it was in Leviticus that there was thirteen kind of commands, okay. But it, they some of them are lumped together, and so they just broke them apart. Wow. Actually, the least covet for nine and ten. And nine is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And shall not cover, cover your neighbor's good. Oh. So that's how they stretch it out. Wow. That's interesting. I've never, I, I can't believe I've never heard that. Huh. One of those things I ran across when I. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that makes sense, though, because I've. I've thought that thought, like, how do you rationalize this? But I guess that makes sense if it's not in the commandments. And you can. Before I was Christian, I was a Catholic Church. You know, waiting for the, all the icons and 
wants to start you know, moving. And, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next uh, is you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And this is um, just uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 14, 21. And it basically outlines that no one is held blameless when it comes to this. It doesn't matter what type of authority or religious leader you are, or everyone across the board gets this judgment hard if you misuse the name of the Lord your God. Commandment four is observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Uh, and that is Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 16, 17. And this is just basically God has the right to receive honor for work and creation and really also what he did to bring them out of Egypt. Um and this talks about dedicating goods, like it said, the 10% to the religious leaders, 10% to the poor. Um, it talks about the dedication of goods and all that to in this section as well. All right, so now we have a transition from um, divine to human. So any comments before we move on? This is the picture that they were talking about with the box on the forehead and box on the arm. Uh huh. Yes, phylactery. Phylacteries. It's one of the modern Jewish sects. It says. Yeah. Pretty weird, but okay. So, commandment five. Honor your father and mother. Uh, and this is, so I love this. This, Moses talks about how the family structure is basically how the Israelites are going to survive. And all of that starts with acknowledging that there is a human authority, your mother and father. And if that's true, then um, it goes back to my proofing classes. If that's true, then there's a human authority over your mother and father. And so that, that helps glue together the structure of Israel and helps them survive because of this simple rule, honor your father and mother. And as a caveat, um, this is how I also prove that life is, at least maybe to myself, maybe, but uh, this is how I also justify saying that life is good and it's worth being here on earth because the reward for honoring your father and mother is long life. And why would God give us such a reward for such a difficult task if it didn't mean something? Um, so here is the order that Moses lays out for structure. God communicates his instructions through the prophets. That's one. Two. The priests instruct the people in the word of God. And if someone writes stuff and I talk too fast, just let me know. Three, kings are responsible for setting up a system based on the instructions of God. So we have prophets, uh, priests, kings, and then judges enforce the system that's been set up. And then there's a need for everyone to honor that system and honor those people, honor those human authorities, um, because each of them play a significant role in God's plan for Israel. All right, so the next set of commandments are a little bit weird. They group them kind of all together, and there's not really any cohesion in um in transition between these next three. So you have, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal. And the Bible verses are up there, commandments six through eight. Um, the dignity of existence. So life may be taken without violating the sixth, life may be taken without violating the sixth commandment. 
and Moses says this is for things such as war and uh, what was the other one? Oh, capital punishment. So violation of laws. If the instruction was to kill them, then you're not violating the sixth commandment by killing them. And Moses says this pretty explicitly. So what do you guys think about capital punishment then? Because I've usually in general been pretty against it, but, and most of it happens to be because of that, um, that commandment. Anyone have any thoughts or pondered it at all? Um, the only issue that I would have with capital punishment is um, I, I think I, I think if if judgment is correct and judgment is accurate and judgment is fair and and if the law uh, deems that uh, the capital comes necessary, right? Then I'm for it. Um, my own my issue is it, it, it you know the the, the system isn't always fair. Uh, the system oftentimes is biased. Uh, it's blind in the wrong way, in the sense that it it, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it's it's blind in the sense that it's a, um, it could be dumb to the evidence, you know. Uh, so, because of that, that would be my only uh, detractor from that. The only reason why I wouldn't want it, because there are many, many people that are on death row that have been falsely accused. Um, so, anyway, there you have it. It's a good point. I agree with it in, in, in principle. Yeah. Actually, where, which chapter and verse does, does, does most commit to capital punishment? He talks about it in, let's see. Um, I should have wrote stuff in my actual Bible when I was reading this because I took notes on stuff and then now I don't know where Oh, yeah. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hangman is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. I guess that begs the question: which which, which sins deserve death? I think the doesn't the Levitical law yeah. so point that out? Yeah. Most of the capital punishment are um, homicide, um, and sexually related. Okay, um, so I think there's. 
introduce a couple, you know, uh, blessing and reward. Usually God takes care of that as far as <laughs> when I read it in the Old Testament. <laughs> but there, there was, you know, it was somebody accidentally killed somebody else. There were sanctuary cities mm -hmm. that they could go to. Could run to, uh, and that usually ran until the high priest died and the new high priest was died. Um, but that was for the people who were seeking retribution, so that way that person wouldn't be. They, it, uh, it, it's like the Cain and Abel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he went to the city to, for protection. Yeah. And I think there was five cities that they had set aside for for refuse a refuge. And they had their own Levitical priests and everything. They were they were full blown cities. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember uh reading that and I was like, wow, this is interesting. And there and there's really no effort, you know, to ask to uh and to, to look into the matter or investigate, it, it literally it is they can go and, and, and receive protection there against the, the, the family members that are looking to, to get mm -hmm. at this guy. Um, but there's no attempt by the priest or anybody to look into the matter or investigate it and say, you know, the crew is false or, or, or absolve them of any responsibility, right? So I, think the pre I think they have to make their case at the at the gate, right? To, to the like the there's a judgment of a set of priests i think i think that's an odd number like three or five i think that's what i remember reading that there's a judgment of a couple priests you have to have, a, you have, to have some sort of a legitimate claim that it was correct i think so yeah cleaning sanctuary and cleaning church and what you need to do in some countries, once you make it to church, that they can't come in. The church takes your protections. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, that was the dignity of existence. Um, the dignity of homogeneity is uh, just basically the, the uh, things where things belong where they belong. So saying like you shouldn't co covet your uh, brother's things because those are, are his. They belong with him. And so that kind of leaks over uh, Moses is talking to uh, spouses also. You shouldn't covet your brother's wife because she doesn't belong with you. She belongs with him because he's the one who married her. Um. And the dignity of personhood. And these are all the sections in six through eight. And this is just viewed in the larger context as an invasion of privacy. So it talks about kidnapping and um, people feeling violated and how the victim should be treated and all that stuff. Um, commandment nine. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, oh, this picture. So this is a picture of someone using a millstone. And one of the um, things stated by Moses is that you shouldn't take your brother's millstone, even if you just take the top of it, because it's not functional without the top of it. So... Um, if your brother has something, don't even take part of that because then it becomes non-functional and then you don't have a millstone to make bread and then you die because you haven't eaten. Um, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. That is commandment nine. Um, and that's 24, eight through 16. And this is just deal truthfully with your neighbors. And that's probably a good, um, a good, law to live by yourself but i think there's an example later in the old testament where um is it david there, there's a judge under david who's judging and someone does give false testimony 
and they basically take him outside the city and stone him. And it, I think it was something small too. It wasn't something. Um, it was, huh? Yeah, yeah. It just says it, it, he was found to be lying, and they took him outside the city, and everyone stoned him to death. So that's interesting. Um, commandment ten is you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And coveting is just basically desiring something that's possessed by another. Um, oh, I highlighted this to read the whole thing. The legislation surrounding this commandment suggests that the rights of individuals need to be protected. These include the right to justice, the right to basic food and shelter, the right to bear children, the right to fair treatment, and the right to a fair wage. Furthermore, it urges that rights we enjoy ought not to be taken for granted. So it puts onus on the um, community and then on the self. It shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, so, let's see. I'm trying to remember what that picture is. Anyways, what? Yeah. The photo, it says, the caption says, do not muzzle an ox while it is tre treading out the grain. Deuteronomy 25.4. Um, to separate the grain from the head, an ox would pull a heavy sledge over the grain on the threshing floor. This instruction forbids the owner to muzzle the animal in order to keep it from eating the grain as it works. It's an interesting concept. Um, so, this is question. Eight on page 51. The importance of Deuteron Deuteronomy is that it makes clear that the law was never intended to be a mechanical list of inflexible rules. Um, the law provides a background basically for what god is looking for and through uh, morality basically so the law of is something that's written down but then at some point it should come from the heart that these what is moral and what is not basically and this is something that's highlighted as something that jews really appreciate about their god especially at this time because uh, the people of Canaan worshiping other deities, those deities could flip on a dime every day what they desire, what they want. Kings were considered deities, so they could change what their desire was. And you never knew really from day to day what would please these deities. So you could be in their good graces one day, and then the next day you're not, and you have no idea why. The Jewish God laid out all of his rules and requirements, and he said, these are the things that make me happy. This is how you can get closer to me. This is how you can present a area, at least in the world, that I can dwell in, uh, which is awesome. And then the question three, what is the Shema? The Shema? Shema. Shema. And that is um, the Hebrew word for here. And it's found in six, four through five. And that's a like a big part of the summary of this is that, um, you know, Jews really took that to heart. Here, we can just read it. Hmm. Yeah. I think they have a list of prayers that they can do. They have to do one. They have to do that one. And then the other two, they have some that they can or don't have to. And a lot of them choose to just do this three times a day. Um, so it's six, four through five. Does someone want to read it? So I don't have to keep hearing my own voice. All right. Six, four through five, four. Mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you shall uh, command you today shall be in your heart. Um, I'm sorry, how far do I read? You can read through nine is where the yeah. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. Amen. So that probably applies to us also. Um, and this is no wonder Jesus decided to use this as the um, first most important law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And then the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And he just divided the Ten Commandments into two sections and said, if you follow these, all the Ten Commandments will be followed. Um, let's see. So like the second guy said, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is just means second law. And that comes from uh, 16. And again, the point of this was Moses just saying, hey, this is what happened before you were here. We got this law. This is what God means by it. Here's a couple of examples. But take this as an instruction to write morality on your heart. And um, and attempt to please God that way, which, as we know, does, didn't work. And um, everything he said, they didn't do at some point. And then, you know, we, I don't want to spoil the rest, I guess. Um, questions? If not, we can go through the answers. Yes, sir. Quick one. The uh, ox is being in Second Timothy. They're talking about especially others who doing well to consider worthy of government honor, especially for those who labor in preaching and teaching. The scripture says, You should not marvel in an ox when it's setting out grain, and the laborers deserve his wage. They actually, so this, this kind of points to how the priests receive something. I don't know. I don't remember if Nicole mentioned it Sunday or not, but the way that the priests um, got their food was they would cook it and then they would stick a fork, like a fork in it and they just got what was there. So as they were working, they would, they took their portion, their food. And then um, that's what they got. That was theirs, which happened to be the best. There's a lot of legislation or rules in Leviticus to deal with um, the burnt offering is an entire offering. The uh, sin offering and guilt offering and even the peace offering, a portion of it goes to the priests. Mm -hmm. Either the entire priesthood or the priest or presiding over the, the service. Um, so there was, even in Leviticus, early Leviticus was, there was portions set aside for the Levites because they didn't inherit any anything. The yeah. Of the tribe. Yeah. They were forced into the city. And I think there might have been some grazing land, but not, yeah. not any agricultural Please. Yeah, it's a beautiful interaction to read read all of that stuff between God and the Levites. Um, okay, so, oh, and the retribution principle is just conforming to God's expectations is rewarded. Violating his commandments brings punishment. And that's the summary of what that means. So... What does the book of Deuteronomy summarize? This is question one. The message of the law and the message of the covenant. Or that's basically the summary.
Question two, critical theories. I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't find them in the book. Uh, it seems a little obscure to me. I'm, I don't know what that even means. So I didn't answer it. I didn't know. Do you have an answer key? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't have an answer key to these. Number two. Probably talking about uh, authorship merges or whether it's a post that file. Oh, you know, yeah, from the expectation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've read most of that and I found it pretty interesting, but I, I didn't think that it was worth talking about because I wasn't sure if. Um, it would be, you know. Yeah, when you get into textual criticism or source criticism, they get. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm just spouting someone else's opinion that, yeah. you know. Um, it's just very, very contentious. So I guess then the two theories would be whether Moses wrote Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy or if the priest did afterwards. And apparently well afterwards um, is what they think. Yeah. Um, the four topical issues are authority. It's one. Two is dignity. Three is commitment. And then four is rights and privileges. And like I said, commandments one through four, they're addressed how these deal with God. And then five through 10 is how these deal with people. Chapters six through 11 differ from chapters 12 through 26 in that they do not consist of individual laws. Explain what is meant by the following statement. The second commandment is seen to go far beyond a prohibition against the use of idols. Um, and this is just saying that God needs a different type of worship than pagan worship. And the focus isn't necessarily idols, but centrality of a um, of worship. Divination is seeking information about the future from a supernatural source. So we talked about a even say that in the Hebrew culture, even the things that they sacrifice and almost they could be sacrificed an animal and then expect the the insides to see that they can judge by the size of the kidney that the living living to go to war. Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah. Their guys were little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Iffy. They didn't communicate as clearly, I don't think. They needed a Moses. Um, briefly describe the reasons for and against mosaic authorship um so just just a couple of the things is temple worship the the deuteronomy talks about temple worship and the argument is this couldn't have been a problem um before the death of or yeah this couldn't have been a problem before the death of moses centrality because they were moving in the tent anyways um, it was once they settled that this would have been a problem. And another one is chapter seven. They say that chapter 17 must have been after the establishment of a monarchy. And as I said earlier, 
it's best understood that Moses is the dominant principal and determinative voice of the book with few sections being added. Yeah. Yeah. And thankfully they had better memories than we do with stuff like that. If you recite the Shema and the prayers every day. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes kind of muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And plus you don't have technology and, and everything else. Uh, and you're just trying to overwhelm your brain. Yeah. Well, you can look at school. You know, I grew up with Catherine Lee was doing a lot of we won't allow these calculators to even like you just get one and calculate stuff aside. Yeah. Um, what provides evidence for the unity of the book? It takes the structure of an ancient Near Eastern vassal treaty and more than 50 such treaties have been found. from the middle third millennium to the middle first millennium BC. Destruction. But I won't wipe you out. Promise people after all. Uh, and what type of treaty does it most closely emulate? The mid-second millennium treaty, which would date confidently to the time of Moses. We talked about four already. Um, the difference between the laws in the Bible and the laws of ancient Near East would be the laws of the ancient Near East served as self-serving, while the laws in the Bible point to the authority of God. Their law changed day to day, but Yahweh's was the same. Number six, why was centralization on the temple so important for Israel? It preserved uniformity in religious teaching and practices. Yeah. 
than we can make people with free spirit. Then we have kind of responsibility. Yeah. So, good, yes, Deuteronomy. I think I think I found this most um, recent yearly Bible expedition for myself. Probably one of the most useful um, ever, because I'm I'm seeing things in here that are explaining the Ten Commandments to me, basically, and explaining what the intent was behind that. And that's straight from the horse's mouth, the intent, because the Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses. And um, and we see when Moses interprets or doesn't do what God says, there's harsh punishment. So I imagine that these are um, as accurate as it comes when it comes to the intent of what the Ten Commandments were trying to say. Um, let's see. Questions? Did everyone get the questions uh, in the book answered? Yeah. Comments, concerns, exacerbations? All right. Next, we go to... Oh, next week we'll just kind of do a... Um, summary of kind of what happened and then an introduction to what's about to come. Uh, so we're moving out of the Torah and moving into the historical books, which is probably my favorite. If Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible, the historical books are probably my favorite section of the Bible. It's fascinating, full of stories, full of war, full, full of, uh, it's like, it's like watching a, um, it's like watching a TV series, reading through this stuff. Good yeah, it, it truly is. I mean, the, the yeah, it hooks you in. There's one with that thing. And he went from here to here. On the, where's that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I do the same thing. You're looking at the map and like. Where, where <laughs> because you want to know, oh, yes. You want to know, um, Hello? How far they're going? Yeah. Well, yeah. The, from the upper Galilee to the, the 